All right, we got some owners meeting stuff to attend to. Kyle Shanahan, John Lynch, Jed York all speaking with media, discussing uh, current additions, people who have left, and, of course, what is going on with Brandon Ayuk. But there's been plenty of other things outside that topic as well that we can cover. Plenty of rule changes that have been going down across the NFL. Lots of things that have impact to the San Francisco 49ers. So we're going to react to all of that right now. I haven't seen you guys for a couple days, so we got a lot to talk about, but you already know what to do. Drop your SDS in the chat, smash that like button, and let's talk about it all right now. Smash that like button if you haven't already. Love to see you. Man, I cannot believe it is already Tuesday. Uh, felt like a long weekend for me. Um, you guys didn't see me live yesterday. I ended up going uh, to Tahoe. I did a little day trip. Had to get some, some time out there on the snow. Um, and while I was out there on the snow, we heard from John Lynch yesterday giving us some updates, and then we heard from Kyle Shanahan today. Uh, we also heard from Jed York yesterday, uh, so we'll talk about a bunch of those different things as well. I think one of the things that came out of the, the Jed York thing was he is going to be the principal owner of the San Francisco 49ers. Obviously, his title right now is listed as CEO, but he will become primary owner of the 49ers, and after kind of listening to him talk about it, it does sound like it was more of a logistical thing in regards to getting his family estate in order and all those different types of things, uh, you know, kind of the natural progression of how all that stuff goes. But hey, uh, just quickly on Jed York, I, I think Jed um, has done a really quality job, um, you know, since he came under scrutiny with the handling of the Jim Harbaugh situation and, you know, the Trent Balky situation to Jim Tom Sula to uh, Chip Kelly and everything in between. And obviously caught a lot of flack uh, for some of those things. But I really do uh, appreciate uh, Jed and uh, how he's he's continually one, pick the right staff. I mean, to be able to hire Kyle Shanahan, and again, it was also, you have to remember from the story and the way that it's been told is that Kyle Shanahan had no interest in being the 49ers head coach, but Jed was able to convince Kyle um, with the transparency and uh, accountability and ownership of past mistakes and just being transparent. And when you look at the success that the 49ers have had with John Lynch, a, a first time general manager coming out of the booth, you know, having that trust and faith um, to put that into Kyle to make that selection and, and bringing in a first time head coach, first time general manager after the the things that had transpired prior to that, I think that deserves a lot of credit. Like he deserves credit for one somehow swaying Kyle Shanahan to the San Francisco 49ers and then letting those guys do their jobs. And they've done a pretty good job at that. And I think the group as a, as a unit, when you throw in Parag Marate as well, and kind of like the four almost feels like the four pillars of the 49ers franchise, um, you know, you have uh, John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan as like your football ops guys. You have Parag, who's president of the company and handle, it's got his hands in multiple different things, including contracts and negotiations and all those different things. And then, of course, what Jed does as CEO, 
those four guys really are the kind of pillars of the 49ers organization right now. So tip your cap to Jed York. Um, I, I, I don't think he's deserving of any of the, you know, he, he was a punching bag there for a second, for sure. Um, especially on Twitter and whatever on social media. But I do think Jed has uh, definitely uh, done what he's needed to do um, to, to make sure the 49ers get back to their winning ways. And that's exactly what they've done. Um, I, I really do think too, when you look at the 49ers, you look at the culture that they have, they're, they're one of the best organizations in all of football right now. Um, so you got to give a lot of credit, uh, to Jed cause it could have spiraled. It really could have, it could have spiraled. He got it back on track and, uh, everything, everything came together. Um, for the most part. So shout out to Jed. Uh, I believe it's officially the principal owner. Um, but anyways, we also had some news again, some late news from yesterday. George Kittle, Traverius Ward had core muscle surgery. They're going to be all right with that. Um, John Lynch spoke about, um, Brandon Ayuk situation, basically saying there's been no trades. Uh, all the reports are uh, inaccurate and that they would be okay with Brandon Ayuk playing on the fifth year option. We also heard from Kyle Shanahan today on the Brandon Ayuk situation. Uh, I thought the funny thing about the whole uh, Brandon Ayuk situation was that Kyle Shanahan ran into Brandon Ayuk in Cabo amidst all these things that have been going on and <laughs> in, in a in a Kyle fashion just like nonchalantly was like uh yeah he was randomly at the hotel that are at our hotel um and I don't think he wanted to be there like because we ran into him <laughs> and um but again uh all the I think all the messaging coming out of the 49ers is you know Kyle Shanahan spoke today said hopefully we get this deal done sooner rather than later and i believe that's i i don't believe there's anything to you know tinfoil hat or or any of that I, I i've never believed at all throughout this entire situation that the san francisco 49ers don't want to keep brandon Ayuk. I, I think it's pretty evident and clear that the 49ers want brandon Ayuk around um and why wouldn't you all pro second team, all pro what he was able to do this past season. BA is a dog. We all know what it is. We don't have to go through his resume. We all know what he brings to the table and we all know about his rapport with Brock Purdy and you want to keep those guys together. So I don't think there's any, any stretch of the imagination that would say that, you know, the 49ers don't want Brandon Ayuk. I think obviously when we heard some of those comments come out yesterday, that's when BA posted to Instagram. And then we had um, our first emoji gate of the off season. And so everyone's now reacting to Brandon Ayuk's emojis. I mean, I've saw it pretty much everywhere on the internet today. I saw Rich Eisen reacting to it. I saw Chad Ochocinco and, and Shannon Sharp reacting to it. So, everyone's reacting to to kind of like what Brandon Ayuk said and you know it was very apparent of what he was saying um with those emojis and that entire situation um but bottom line is that i think what it is is that the 49ers have a there's multiple perspectives here right we got a fan perspective player perspective team perspective the team perspective is we're chilling because you're under contract next year uh, we picked up your option and then we have additional control beyond that so when you hear i think a lot of the verbiage coming out of the 49ers of uh, we're be we're being patient um you know we're we're fully you know, we don't want him to go anywhere. We're okay with him playing on the fifth year option. The 49ers, I think, would be over the moon 
if they could get Brandon Ayuk to go out and put up another all pro season on a fifth year option. I think they would, that would be one of the biggest steals in regards to value in the entire NFL in 2024. If you got Brandon Ayuk on the field for 17 plus games at $14 million, uh, that is probably the biggest steal in the NFL. Um, what did what did Jerry Judy get? Jerry Judy got a, a contract where he's getting paid like nineteen million next year. That's crazy. So Brandon Ayuk, who's done more in the NFL than guys like Jerry Judy, would be getting paid less. That's crazy. That's why the 49ers, and rightfully so, from their business perspective. Um, they're fine. <laughs> the 49ers are fine. Um, and I think when we're seeing Brandon Ayuk, uh, going through all of this, he wants to get paid and, and rightfully so, uh, he wants to get the bag and he doesn't want to get paid less than he's deserved. So the question that keeps, I think, coming up is Brandon staying or not. Nah, I really think as long as the 49ers and Brandon and you can mutually agree to a, a, a beneficial deal, then Brandon Ayuk isn't going anywhere. Brandon Ayuk will stay. Well, he's he's staying, I believe, for the most part, um, just because he's currently under team control. So the team controls his rights. They control what he can and can't do from that aspect of it. But in all reality, like I felt like Debo Samuel had a better chance of getting traded than Brandon Ayuk. And Debo ultimately wasn't able to get a deal done um with another team for this from what we've learned and gathered from information that has come out from that situation was that the jets offered a deal it wasn't enough 49ers declined they kept uh they kept debo and they paid him that off season i kind of feel like the similar fate could be coming for uh brandon iu I just don't see a world that exists where a team is going to give the compensation needed to the San Francisco 49ers for them to facilitate a trade because the team that is trading for Brandon Ayuk has to turn around and pay him. That drops the value of the trade in regards to a compensation standpoint. So if a team isn't willing to give up a first round pick plus then it's a non-starter. It's a non-conversation in regards to trading Brandon Ayuk. So I really think Brandon's going to be staying for the simple fact of I do feel that the 49ers have majority of the leverage at this point in this situation. So that's kind of why I think we are seeing what we're seeing is I can't I can't speak from Brandon's perspective, because I don't know what the contract negotiations or talks look like. It sounds like they're kind of still waiting and, and not really engaging too much in those types of conversations. And as we know, the 49ers, they push it to the brink every time. I mean, look at look at what happened with uh, all the contracts that have pretty much gone gone down. I think Eric Armstead was one of the guys that got paid ahead of time that we weren't expecting. Uh, all the other ones, Kittle, um, Debo, Bosa, they've all been pushed all the way up to the limit uh, of when it is to get it done. So. It basically it basically boils down to this. We have an imaginary deadline, which is the first round of the NFL draft. If for whatever reason things sour, it's just so bad that the 49ers have to try to get some kind of value for him as best they can, then maybe something 
uh, is facilitated around the draft, but I don't think, uh, I don't know if it does. I don't, I really don't know if it does. Again, the, the, the sticking point here is I think any player is potentially tradable if you give enough compensation. But if a team is coming to the 49ers and they're like, listen, we'll give you a second or fourth round pick for Brandon Ayuk. You're hanging up the phone. You're you're instantly like, no, I'm not trading Brandon Ayuk for a second and a fourth round pick. It doesn't make any sense for the 49ers from a roster building standpoint, because why would you lose one of your best players and recoup, hopefully, two guys that maybe contribute? overall in the totality of their careers let alone just the following year so i think all the signs are pointing to to ba returning i think they've been pointing that way for a while and i think part of like the disconnect in this conversation about ba is just like all the different things that are being jungle juggled at one time so the way it stands right now i think i think ba set to return if i had to bet on it i would bet on him returning if i had to bet on it i would bet on them coming to some form of an agreement before training camp because i really don't think brandon Ayuk should be playing football on for for 14 million dollars in 2024 um that to me just feels like well, when we talk about this league and what this league represents and and how challenging it is for players to get paid sometimes i don't think that's i don't think that's right i don't think brandon Ayuk. i, I understand that the fifth year option is available for teams and all they're doing is executing what they have to, at their disposal that there's also it's like it's a it's a dual edged sword it's like how do you fault the 49ers for identifying a first round draft pick at wide receiver hitting on it and then using the triggers in place like a fifth year option to their benefit like it's i, I don't fault them either it's like it's a but that's why I think there needs to be this this kind of situation where they need to come together and um, I think they need to work something out before uh, this this upcoming season because I don't think Brandon Ayuk uh, deserves to to have to play um, next year for an amount that is less than what Jerry Judy is currently making with the Browns. That just doesn't seem right. Um, so the hope is, is that the 49ers can meet BA in the middle, get BA something nice, get him something nice, make him feel wanted and appreciated something that him and his team would be okay with but also doesn't kill you as an organization later on down the road and then shake hands move on let's go win a super bowl that that's honestly the hope of this situation but again we just got to wait and see and again one of the reasons why i'm optimistic about ba sticking around is just because the 49ers are in control of that situation right now and i don't think they want him gone so i think they want ba I, everyone wants ba i think you'd be crazy to, to not want ba um you know but what does ba want is anyone asking that question? Is anyone asking what BA wants in this situation? What is what is BA looking for? Well, what is what is BA trying to accomplish? What does BA really want? Does that align with what the 49ers want? I don't know. We're gonna find out. But uh it is 
what it is. And so, like I said, um, the the real invisible deadline for for Brandon Ayuk to get traded is the draft. If we get beyond the first round, BA to me is a guaranteed lock. And <clears throat> if I if even if I had to put like a percentage on it based on all the information that we've talked about, BA is probably like sitting at like a 5% chance that he gets traded. Um, even with all the kind of nose, uh, the noise and the smoke and all that stuff, like I would still say like there's a 95% chance BA is a 49er next year. And um, I would imagine beyond that as well. But again, anything can happen and a lot can happen in that 5%. So I think we just got to wait and let it play out um what other stuff did we get today um and yesterday from all this stuff we got uh nick Sorensen and brandon staley uh kind of updates it does sound like Sorensen will be calling the plays for the defense but brandon staley will be a big part of the game plan brandon staley apparently has already been a big part of the San Francisco 49ers roster building process. And honestly, not super surprised by that. Um, you know, I think, I think Staley, I think Staley is going to be a bigger part of what the 49ers do this year than a lot of people wanted to kind of wrap their heads around. This is something that we've talked about, you know, lead in the lead up to the 49ers picking their DC is that the fan base absolutely could not stand the idea of Brandon Staley becoming the defensive coordinator. And so I think instead of naming him the DC, I think they went the smart route by, you know, bringing in an internal guy, an internal hire to take on that role, bring in Staley to kind of be a, bouncing board for Sorensen and for Kyle and just be a high level assistant. And we're already seeing that he's having input in the roster construction. He was apparently big in, uh, you know, signing off on Leonard Floyd and how Leonard Floyd practices and all those different types of things, according to Kyle Shanahan. So, Hey, Staley, I've always I've said it. I was I was one of the the rare people that are like, I don't hate Staley as much as everyone else. I, in fact, I don't hate Staley. Um, I really don't. Um, I, I think there are some good qualities that Staley brings to the table. Did it work with him as a head coach with the Chargers? No, but I don't think that means he can't coach um, all of a sudden. So, again, I've been one of the rare people that didn't hate the whole Staley idea. Um, I didn't love it. I'll say that as well, but I also wasn't um, super against it. And I think we're already seeing, um, at least according to Kyle Shanahan, some of the things that he has alluded to that Staley has helped with and some of that being on the roster side of things. So there you go. Um, we also heard that Mick Lombardi, uh, the guy, the former offensive coordinator for the Raiders that the 49ers hired still doesn't have a title, but he will likely fill Clint Kubiak's role as the past game coordinator. Um, so you have that information out there of, of what that's going to look like. Um, I think one of the moves that could kind of, uh, correlate with this move is the Rams, before we hopped on here, uh, they signed Tredavious White to a one-year deal. Um, pretty pretty decent deal for a guy coming off uh, an Achilles injury. Uh, eight and a half million. There's some, some incentives baked into that deal. Uh, but, I mean, the Rams go out there. The Rams, I think, low-key been doing some, some quality work in regards to kind of building up that roster. Um, you know, I keep my eye on the division uh, and 
you know, the Rams, I always pay attention to how all of our teams draft. Um, and I've noticed that all three teams, the Seattle Seahawks, Rams, and Cardinals had pretty decent drafts last year. And that was one of the things that stood out to me after the draft. I was like, oh, all these teams got better via the draft. And then we saw um, that come to fruition for the Rams when they got uh, Byron Young. They got, of course, um, the wide receiver, Puka Nakua. Um, I think it's Kobe Turner in the middle, I believe, as well. Steve Avila, I believe, guard for them as well. Um, so, and then they they dropped some bank into their offensive line. And um, they got two new cornerbacks now. So the hey the Rams I would say got better. The Rams I, I would say got better. Seattle TBD. Uh, they have a new coaching staff, obviously, um, and so and they still have Geno, and I think Geno is a bridge quarterback for them. Um, so we'll see how that that ultimately goes. But uh, the 49ers got to look at division, of course, right? And uh, you've got their, you've got your division rivals signing former all pros. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. They got Sam Howell. I forgot about that. Good call. Good call. Um, but we also heard about the 49ers potential to add to their secondary today. Um, Kyle Shanahan was asked about Talano Hufanga. Um, he gave a rough estimation of when he expects Talano Hufanga to return. Um, sounds like they're anticipating training camp. Um, one thing that I've learned about Kyle, and you can even point back to last year, is Kyle isn't going to give you definitive timelines on injuries. And if he gives you any timeline, he's going to give you the worst possible outcome um, because I think it it alleviates the expectation of a player returning to being like soon. And if there are drawbacks, then it becomes an issue. Like think about last year at the owners meetings when John Lynch spoke and he was like, oh, when do you guys think you're going to see Brock Purdy? Is Brock Purdy going to be available for training camp? Coming off the UCL surgery to his elbow. And John Lynch was like, oh, yeah, I've, I've, it, we're on track. We're on track for the start of training camp. We're on track for the start of training camp. Everyone reacts to it like, let's go. Brock's going to be back. Uh, start a training camp. Never a doubt. <laughs> you know, like we're all hyped. Like. Let's go. Brock's going to be back. Kyle speaks the next day to the to the media and he goes, eh, we're looking at Brock Purdy returning uh, week one through three. <laughs> and everyone like then the complete narrative switched fire alarms going everywhere. Oh, my God. We might have Sam Darnold starting for the first three weeks of the season. Oh, man, that was a fun time that that. That 24 hour like cycle in uh, talking points just because of one guy giving the optimistic likely outcome and then the other guy giving the non optimistic, like don't get your hopes up <laughs> outlook and just the, the way it was like reacted to was pretty was pretty funny. So that's my my story with Kyle when it comes to like giving out like windows of like he could return in this window. So to me, what I've learned is sometime during training camp, as I think Talano Fungo will be ready for training camp. <laughs> <coughs> I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll see. Um, but with that being said, it's clear 
that the 49ers have been poking around. Uh, some potential starting safeties. Julian Blackman was in the building. Um, he's an intriguing prospect because he's he's young. Um, he he's 25 years old. Um, and he's got a lot of quality playing experience under his belt. He was in the building, and it sounds like it sounds like the 49ers didn't guarantee him a starting job. You know what I mean? It's like we have Jair Brown. They love Jair Brown. Um, I w- I have okay, I gotta do my I gotta do my sourced information thing. Um was speaking to someone very high up in the 49ers organization at the NFL combine in Indianapolis. And we were talking about Jair Brown and just like, they love Jair Brown inside that building. Like they love the kid, like, you know, having to be able to interview him at the time, uh, Jason Aponte was with me as well. He also interviewed him. So we we have like personal experience talking to Jair. And so we were able to be having this conversation about like, dude, Jair Brown is a real dude. Like when it when it comes to like scouting the person, like Jair's Jair's just presence is so legit for someone who's so young. And that was the same vibe that we were getting from this gentleman who works very high up in the 49ers personnel department. So we were just talking about Jair. So like they genuinely love the kid. I really believe that they love Jair Brown. And so to me with them, not guaranteeing um, Julian Blackman a job to be the starter. I also think that's, that's a vote of confidence for Jair. But I think it's also a vote of confidence for Talano Hufunga, who's kind of been thrown into this mix the last couple weeks of, are the 49ers moving on from Talano Hufunga? Um, and all those different types of things. And I do think it's a vote of confidence for the guys in the building that at minimum, we know competition is going to be brought in. It's the NFL. Like, let's, let's, it's, that's how it works. But to also, not be guaranteed that you've already lost your job um, before you've even taken a snap in training camp. I also think that's a good move. So, hey, if a guy is looking to come in for a guaranteed starting role, I don't know if that's what the 49ers are looking for right now. I think they want a guy who's willing to compete for the starting job, i.e. to Sean Gibson kind of how that whole situation worked out. That's why I kind of feel like Micah Hyde is the name that I keep coming back to. Um, I feel like Micah Hyde fits that role very, very well for like he had like he's older, like he's definitely older, but he is a leader like he has a ton of experience. Um, he's definitely older. I got I, I got him by like six months. So he's like six months younger than I am. So he he's up there. He's up there in age, but I feel like he's a guy who could contribute, especially um, as a leader, as a role player. If you're looking for a guy, who's trying to just latch on and get a championship, you know, this late into his career. I mean, really, for the most part, Micah Hyde was uh, an iron man. He, he, the first time he missed significant time was in 2022 where he only played in two games. But after that, in 2023, he came back, he played in 14 games, had 37 tackles, two interceptions, seven pass deflections. Um, so uh, to me, he feels like that, that would be kind of a guy that would fit um, what you're looking for. Like maybe a year could start if needed. 
uh, has the veteran, uh, you know, processing ability. Maybe has lost a step, but smart. It's going to be be where he's supposed to be. Could fit, could fit that role. Um, so it'll be interesting. But the safety market does appear a little bit dry right now. So it doesn't feel like anyone's really, really in a rush to make a move. And I wonder if the Micah Hyde thing um, accelerates maybe the market for guys like Xavier Howard. Um, Xavier Howard's a guy that I like a lot. For the 49ers, I think he would be a good fit. Um, and again, for the things that you could do um, at uh, cornerback by keeping Demo in the the nickel, um, you have Isaac Yadam as well, who has some potential, has some potential, but, um, you know, you never know. And um, Jeffrey says, hate to waste a spot on Micah Hyde. I think we're set at the position. We're not. We aren't set at the position. Um, because if the, the way that the 49ers would be set at the position um, is if they had four safeties uh, that are of the caliber that the 49ers expect to carry on the final roster. Right now, they only have three. Right now, they only have Talano Funga coming off of ACL, Jair Brown, and George Odom. Outside of that, you got practice squad guys. Um, you don't have that fourth option right now. So I believe the 49ers arguably biggest remaining holes of the roster are safety because they need that fourth guy regardless of who it's going to be, a starter or a backup. They need one more safety. That, to me, is a non-negotiable. So when you say we're good at the position, I fully disagree, but that is my, that's my thoughts on the roster construction. I look at defensive tackle as being still a massive need, and I look at tight end two, massive need, and... Maybe linebacker, maybe get away with linebacker, maybe cornerback. But to me, if I had to rank the the positions of need, um, it would probably be I would go tight end two first, depth safety second, and ooh no. I'd probably put DT. I'd actually probably put defensive tackle first. I probably put defensive tackle first, then tight end two, then depth depth safety. Um, because I'm not confident yet that the combination of Malik Collins and Jordan Elliott can replace. Uh, can replace Eric Armstead. I'm not. I'm not quite sure just yet. And for the people who want a right tackle, I think the key word there is want. And I think we have to understand that from how the 49ers view this. I don't think the 49ers view this as them needing a right tackle. I think they would like to have another offensive tackle, would like to upgrade that position. I don't think the 49ers are viewing this as they need a right tackle. Um, and I think the extension of Colton McKivitz kind of, kind of tells us that. We even heard from Kyle Shanahan today. Um, again, view uh, the way the way I would say uh, the public views offensive line is in 
insanely different than how a team would likely view or evaluate offensive line. So when you look at what Colton McKivitz did last year on a, as a right tackle who started on a Super Bowl caliber team, I think the 49ers look at what he did and say, wow, good job, Colton. Good job. From going from being cut, going from us cutting you, to now oh, you played pretty darn well in your first year as a starter at right tackle with a revolving door at left or at right guard, I might add, um, which presents another challenge in of itself. They don't look at it like 49er fans do. They really don't. I've been trying to say this as best I can to the fans is because I know fans want offensive line and I, I, I'm the offensive line guy. Nothing will make me happier than having the dopest offensive line in all of football. But I just got to talk about, I just got to talk about how the 49ers view this. The 49ers view this as they got a value. They got value with Colton McKivitz. And when you look at what Colton McKivitz is getting paid and what he's doing, he is a value. He is. But 49er fans want a top five right tackle. That's that's the discrepancy, right? That's a discrepancy. Is I think Kyle feels like he can win with Colton and put resources elsewhere. And that's not what everyone wants. So I think, the, again, need versus want is really the conversation that we're having. I don't think the 49ers need a right tackle, but they could want one. I think they should want one. They should want to try to up upgrade their offensive line as best as they can always and forever. Um, I, I've, if it were up to me, I would be going through offensive linemen until I found the, the perfect five that could fit for based on the budget that I have to work with and talent. That's literally, literally every year I scout offensive linemen. I'm like, that guy's a starter. That guy's a starter. That's got, that guy's a starter. They go to other teams and they have success. Um, and that's just the way it's been. You know, the 49ers have found value in trading for Lake and Tomlinson with the fifth round. They find, um, you know, they sign Alex Mack after Weston Richburg has to medically retire. And then they are able to get Jake Brendel as a backup who converts to a starter. Um, they draft, they've had Brunskill, who was an undrafted free agent. And so it, it's hard to say that they don't value offensive line because they have poured resources into it. Banks is a second round pick. Burford's a fourth round pick. Uh, Jalen Moore was a fifth round pick. Uh, what else do we have? They, they've poured resources into the, they obviously traded for Trent Williams. Uh, Colton McKivitz was a fifth round draft pick, I believe. So they have poured assets into the offensive line. I just don't think it's netted um, the results that a lot of fans have wanted to see. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what the 49ers do. I think. I do believe that there is this mindset that the 49ers are locked in to get a tackle at um pick 31 listen i love the idea of an attack uh, tackle at pick 31 but i don't know if that's necessarily going to be the direction they go i really do think there's a world that exists that they they go cornerback they go defensive line defensive tackle 
How upset? I need I need to pull the chat right now. How upset would you be if the 49ers drafted a defensive tackle? Not an edge, a defensive tackle, interior a three tech at pick 31. How, what would your reaction be? The the thing comes across. Goodell walks up with the 31st pick in the NFL draft. The San Francisco 49ers select Braden Fisk, Florida State, defensive tackle, pick 31. Or, or, um, or my, uh, or I was right on cue, or Justin's guy, uh, Newton. I'm seeing a lot of hype pick up on Newton. Justin was one of the first guys, of course, that I've seen on on Newton hype train. And again, a lot of the the likenesses um, that I've seen Justin talk about are to Kalijah Kansi, um, who is very fast interior defensive tackle, uh, very quality pass rusher, which I think is what you want in today's NFL. I think you can 100% rotate base down defensive tackles with just find any 330 pound dude that's over 6'2, and he can be your base down defensive tackle. And then you bring in these other guys to rush the passer from the interior. So it'll be interesting to see what the 49ers ultimately do here. But I don't think it's a lock that it's a tackle. Um, Justin says, what do you do at 31 if Jackson Powers Johnson or Newton are both there at 31? I, I, I'm of the mindset they go defensive tackle. I do. I'm I'm just of the mindset they go defensive tackle. And again, because I think that has to do with positional value. And again, I've told you guys this a million times. I'm so confident at being able to scout um, starting into your offensive linemen in rounds two through five that if these were the options that I had, Positional value would play a role into this because one defensive tackle is a need. I'm I'm not sold on on the combination of the current defensive tackles that we have. Uh, maybe if I see it, my tune will change. But just as it stands right now, I'm not sold on it. And then you look, you have Brendel right now, and I can still get you. Uh, a potential starting center in the third round, fourth round, even like clockwork, like literal clockwork. We can find you that guy. Like, if you want a Jackson Powers Johnson for the cheap, go get Mason McCormick out of South Dakota State, presents the, almost the same type of value just perceived differently smaller school same kind of player nasty can move dudes from point a to point b relatively easy you just got to put the value where are you assigning the value and that's why I'm, I'm still in the mindset that i don't think the 49ers are done with their defense and i think that's the other thing that like 49er fans also struggle with is like, guys, if you look at the current 49ers offense, every single every single player who was a part of this team going to the Super Bowl and almost winning the Super Bowl, taking the Super Bowl to overtime, has returned. That includes the offensive line, wide receivers, Warner gets a pass because he's not a starter. 
But fullback, running back, quarterback, that offense that was leading the league in a lot of statistical categories has returned. What was the biggest issue that we had last year? Was defense. And heading into the draft, we still have holes because now we don't have Eric Armstead. Eric Armstead's on the Jacks. Dre Greenlaw might not play next year. Tyler Nohu Fong is coming off an ACL injury. Defense still continues to be one of the biggest needs. And we need, to, we need to be able to differentiate needs versus wants. We want the best offensive line available. We want the best offensive line prospects that we can get. We want to upgrade the offensive line. But is it a need? And again, remember, this offensive line took this team to the Super Bowl. So you have to put yourself in the shoes of the people inside that organization who understand this. And do they say that, oh, we need to pass up on this defensive player because we have to have a right tackle? Because we have to have a center? We have to have a guard? No. I don't think they will. I think they will say, we'll go defensive tackle. We'll go cornerback. We'll, we'll mess around with safety in third round maybe again. And we got to find a linebacker as well. Because you just, you can't, you can't bet on Winters and Jalen Graham being what you hope they are going to be. You have to insulate. You have to insulate yourself with as much talent as possible. And we'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. The line that took us to the Super Bowl? Yes. Are you arguing a fact? If you're trying to to twist the words and say that the 49ers offensive line is the only reason the 49ers went to the Super Bowl, then you're just twisting my words. But if you're trying to argue the fact that this line took us to the Super Bowl, then I don't know what to tell you. I really don't. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> and again need versus want need versus want needs fill holes of something that you don't have want is a an ability to upgrade over something you currently have i know it's a, it's Difficult to process. But you also have to remember. Um, the guy who started. Uh, to kind of bring some continuity to the offensive line. Got hurt really early on in the Super Bowl as well. Yeah. <laughs> My guy says, you're my dog, bro, but I'm surprised we're talking about needing another defensive tackle with that first pick. Bro, we absolutely need to upgrade the right side of the offensive line. Again, I'm presenting to you the way that I truly believe the organization that you love to follow is thinking about this. I think people have a really hard time separating these things of me trying to present to you how I believe the 49ers view this. And then 
like getting these comments like i can't believe we're sitting here talking about getting another defensive tackle we need to upgrade the like dude i'm telling you how i think the 49ers are going to do this just like i told you in free agency <laughs> i said the same thing in free agency like you guys started yelling at me about this in free agency. I'm like, oh no, we need to sign the best of the best. I'm like, the four ers ain't doing that. <laughs> They're not. But uh, but Kivitz is back, and Feliciano is going to be back. Exactly what I said. I said, here's Michael and Winu. If you want to get your hopes up, but there you go. Because everyone's clamoring for, I'll oh, give us give us free agent offensive line. Okay, here's when we knew, but we're not going to sign him. <laughs> we're going to bring back Feliciano. So again, there's two thought processes at play. Two thought processes at play. What you want them to do, and what they think they need to do. I need to make it abundantly clear to everyone who's maybe with the, the first off season with me is that I scout the 49ers. I scout their tendencies. I scout what they are going to do because when I scouted my way of what I would do, I wouldn't hit because they didn't do what I would do. They wouldn't draft the way that I would draft. So I had to learn early on in this process that started back with bulky is that you have to scout the tendencies of the people picking because that is going to put you on the best track to trying to fill the holes and how they're going about building a roster. So when I'm going about this, I'm trying to do my best job at evaluating what the 49ers are going to do. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what I think the 49ers are going to do. That's a different thought process of what I think they should do. That's a different thought process of what I think you think they should do or that person thinks they should do. When I'm telling you this is what I think the 49ers are going to do, that's because I think that's what they're going to do. Doesn't mean I'm co-signing it, agreeing with it. But I can also rationalize it at the same time. So again, I just don't want you guys to yell at me again when the 49ers don't trap the offensive line at 31. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Now that very well could happen. They very well could say, they really could look and say, oh, wow, this guy's available at 31, and he plays offensive line. Let's take him because we actually think he could start this year. Then they do that. Hey, I don't disagree with this at all. I don't disagree with this at all. Joey says, I get that for sure, Brad. A lot of the times, 49ers get it wrong, though. Again, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I don't disagree with this. But again, two things can be true. I can see what the 49ers are going to do. While also not agreeing with what they're going to do. <laughs> but I can also tell you that, hey, this is what I think they're going to do. <laughs> and this is also very true. Many teams get it wrong. A lot of teams get it wrong. Um, <clears throat> think about how many people pass on Puka Nakua last year. Think about how many teams pass on Brock Purdy. Think, like I talk about it all the time. Keenan Allen went in the third round. Ridiculous. 32 GMs got it wrong more than twice. So, and I think another part of it too, it's like when you go through the evaluation process, you also have to understand it's like they, they have information that we don't have. 
they have they have the the like personality uh evals they have the medical evals they have uh their off the field history evals that's a huge part of what what goes into these draft selections that's one thing that i learned throughout this process early on is that we can we can scout on tape as much as we want but if the dude's a knucklehead, then the dude's a knucklehead, and you got to figure that out early on in the process, or else you're just gonna you're gonna take a take a swing and you're gonna whiff. So now, obviously, you can't draft all choir boys either. There's a there's a middle ground. I think the 49ers have done a really good job of being able to identify the guys who got the the switches, the kittles, the the guy the Fred Warners, the great guys off the field. But you put them on the field and they flip the switch and they go into this dark place and they become savages. I think the 49ers have done a really good job um, of doing that type of eval. They also know if, if a guy has showed up to their birthday or not. Arguably one of the biggest um, things that gets overlooked. Um, did your teammates show up? to your birthday or did they not if you know you know if you know you know um <laughs> uh, but the whole i i think part of what i what i'm trying to say is i think we have to look at positional value I think that's one aspect of it. Offensive line is a huge positional value. That's high up there in positional value. Defensive tackle and edge, I would say, high up there in positional value. Cornerback, high up there in positional value. Um, of course, quarterback. But I really think, you know, outside of the elite guys, you know, at tight end or uh, linebacker, or safety, you can find guys. You can find guys later. You can find guys um, that outplay their draft status. So big thing with me, interior offensive linemen, I would push. I, I think that would just be, unless there was a center that just, You know, like Graham Barton, I would definitely, I would consider Graham Barton at 31, not at tackle, for guard or center. I would consider him at 31. I would. Um, I, I think Graham Barton is a very quality prospect. He just lacks, that's the one guy where you can see the, the lack of size kind of show up on tape a little bit. So I totally understand why people are talking about kicking them inside uh, to, to guard or center. But Graham Barton at 31, 49ers take Graham Barton, I would actually be fine with that. I watch his tape, and when you look at him from a technical aspect, baller. He's got all the technique. Um, so that will, that will suit him very well um, for being small. Um, so I don't mind that at all. I would take Barton at 31. Um, Jackson Power Johnson, I haven't done tape work on, so I got to figure that one out. Um, but also guys like um, Troy uh, Fautanu, that dude's considered small. I, I, would consider, I would consider him in the top tier. Tier one, uh, tier one offensive tackle in this class. Um, it's just tier one offensive line. He's like a he's like one of the first offensive line weapons. I would I would draft I would trade up for Troy. Troy would be the best offensive lineman for the 49ers because he can play all five spots. Do you know how rare that is? I don't even have to see him 
play all i i watched like a handful of snaps i was sitting there in indianapolis waiting for the offensive lineman to start working out for whatever reason i picked troy to watch and i start watching troy and within like a couple drives of watching troy i'm like this guy could play every spot he could play both guard spots. He could play the center spot. He could play tackle in the NFL. I'm like, this guy, I'm not sure I've seen an offensive lineman like this enter the draft. And this guy can change the mold of like offensive line archetype. This dude's an athlete. This dude, like when we talk about the struggles with offensive line, a large part is due to all the athletes going to the defensive side. All the athletes go play defensive line. Like, again, I still believe to this day that you you take Eric Armstead and you put him at tackle. I think he has he would had a he would have had a chance to be better than Trent Williams. I tr I, I'll die. I will die on that grave. That Eric Armstead arguably could have been one of the best offensive linemen we've ever seen play. And he chose defensive line. Hey, good for him. He made he made the bat. He's made so much money. Good for him. Good for him picking defensive line. It clearly worked out for him. His first round pick done great things, he would have been probably the best offensive lineman to ever play. But the offensive line don't get athletes like that. And so when you look at Troy and you look at what Troy is as an athlete, and then you see the power, and then you see the feet, and then you see the technique, you're like, oh, he's got it all. I don't care that he's short. Don't care at all that Troy is short. He can play all five spots, and he could very well be the best offensive lineman out of this entire class when it's all said and done. And I saw it in about a handful of reps watching him get prepared for the combine. Rohan was sitting right next to me. I said, I look, I looked at Ro I looked at Rohan. I'm like, dude, Troy is going to destroy this combine. Again, I had no idea who he was until I flipped on the tape. And I'm watch, I'm like, dude, he's going to destroy this combine. How he moves, all, um, he's going to destroy it. Well, what did he do? Went out and killed it. So, man, you want to talk about want versus need? I want the 49ers to trade up to take Troy Fautanu. Like, how do we do that? How does that happen? How how like you want to talk about you want to talk about offensive line? You want to take an offensive line in the first trade up, take Troy Faltano. How do we do that? How do we keep Troy away from Seattle? How do we do that? You want the move? Go get Troy. Troy can, is scheme diverse. Position the the position versatility. I would pick Troy over Mims in a – what's quicker than a heartbeat? What is quicker than a heartbeat? Faster than a heartbeat. What is that? That's how, that's how quickly I would take Troy over Mims. That's how quickly you, – you, you, uh, it would be so quick. So you would take Troy over – yep. You would take Troy over, yep. So wait, you're telling me you would take Troy? Yes, I would. You're like, I haven't even said a name. Exactly. Exactly. Troy has the potential to be a generational offensive lineman. When you see what he does, plus I got to, I got to like listen to him speak. And again, that's a big part of the evaluation. He's a baller. 
He's a baller. And hey, shout out, shout out to my Paulies. Shout out my Uses. Shout out my Tokos. Love you. Love all of you. But there are two kinds. You have the Polynesians who grind. And the Polynesians that are just kind of like, hey, what's good, Oos? Just kind of vibe. And it's very important to differentiate what type of player you're getting out of the... And again, I'm not trying to pigeonhole my poly boys. <laughs> I can already I can already see all, all, the, all the Usos and the Tokos getting ready to come after me. The point is... That was one of the things I played with a lot of Polynesians, man. I played with a lot. And there was it was funny because there was like two kinds of Polynesians. It didn't matter if they're Samoan, didn't matter if they're Tongan, didn't matter if they're Hawaiian. I, I don't know why I, I can't explain it. This is just what I evaluated. You either had some that grinded and were so focused, so locked in, and then the other just were like, we're vibing. We're vibing, and Troy's not one of those kinds of guys. Troy, you could tell, is about his business, and um, he's for real. He's for real. I saw, I saw it from every level. I saw it from being able to talk to him, saw it on tape, and then saw it on the field at the Combine. And Troy, Troy's different, man. Troy's different. Um, I'm not scared by his size at all. Not even in the slightest. Um, that's his big knock right now. And that's probably why he won't be the first offensive lineman taken. I'm not afraid at all by his size. Uh, like how tall he is. Not even. No, I don't. Nope. Not worried at all. Because you have to be able to have the the technique to be able to manage. And yeah, not concerned. Not concerned. His height comes in at 14%. 17%, excuse me. So uh his arms are in the 60th percentile i just saw that comment his arms are in the 60th percentile which again is pretty good um yeah i would i would trade up for troy 100 percent 150 percent if i'm trading for someone i'm trading for troy falton that's who it is. Um, lit, I have zero concern about his perceived lack of size. And again, that's why he's going to slide. He's going to slide because people are trying to pigeonhole him. He's not the prototypical, uh, you know, frame. That's fine. It's fine to watch him be a perennial all pro. At I I feel like Troy, Troy's gonna be one of those guys that could be an all pro at tackle and an all pro to interior offensive line, guard or center. All I think he could be an all pro at all five spots. I don't sure I'm not sure I've ever had that evaluation on an offensive lineman before. No, not I've never had that evaluation on an offensive lineman before, ever, not once. Not I'm very sure of that. I'm very sure uh, that I've never felt that way about evaluating an offensive lineman. So, if you want to trade up, figure out how to go get Faltano. That's who you want in this scheme. Um, based on all the things that I've talked about, you don't have to worry about what position he plays. He's an offensive line weapon. Put him wherever. He'll thrive. He will thrive. You put him at right guard if you want. You want to put him at center 
I'm gonna put him on right tackle. Choice him. So we'll see. We'll see. Something tells me that that uh I I would imagine that NFL scouts would be higher on Troy than the media. But hey, you never know. You never know. So we'll see. <laughs> that Brian Graham could play all five spots. I could play all five spots on the bench. All five of them spots. I sit in every one of them bench spots. Uh, Justin says, did you see the Niners had scouts at Louisville's Pro Day today, possibly watching Isaac uh, Garendo, Jamari Thrash, and Jawar Jordan? Um, I think I saw that somewhere. Um, but I've, 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 Justin, I've, I've started. I've started my thrash studies, but I only got I only got like a a series or two in. Um, and then I got distracted. But I've started. I want to watch Thrash. I know you've been high on him, so he's a guy I see the suddenness that he has. So that's a guy that I'm I'm getting caught up to speed on. Um, both the running backs, I haven't seen enough from them outside of the combine um, to know. But um, I do think the 49ers are going to be potentially drafting a running back. I think that's a real, a real thing. I think a running, another running back is on his way. Uh, I think another tight end is on his way. I think more defensive linemen are on their way. A cornerback, I think, could be on his way as well. Um, so, so we'll see. Justin says it's a route running for me. Thrash can take handoffs too. I've seen him. I've seen him take the end arounds for touchdowns. I've seen that. Um, I have seen that. I've I've noticed that I've been stuck in the trenches when it comes to scouting. Most of the scouting I've done has been offensive or defensive line. Because again, I do think defensive tackle is going to be a much bigger need than folks are wanting to give it credit, which I understand 49er fans are tired of drafting defensive linemen. But guess what? I don't think we're done. <laughs> I don't think we're done. So get your dancing shoes on, folks. Uh, we we got some stuff to figure out. Oh, how's Brad today? Well, thank you for asking, Alex. I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Um, went snowboarding yesterday which was fantastic. Uh, went to, went to Kirkwood. Beautiful, beautiful conditions, beautiful mountain. Um, so kind of just vibed, just vibed today. Today, you know, I'm kind of in this like off season mode, like eh, just taking a little break, but still working kind of a thing. Um, so yesterday was dope. Kirkwood, uh, snow was great. I was actually expecting, uh, it to be icy, but it wasn't. And that was a great, great surprise. Um, I'm sore as hell today, uh, because clearly I need to get into shape and snowboarding requires muscles that I didn't even know existed. Um, but yeah, I would say I'm pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> I 
Chili says, I can imagine Brad snowboarding. Probably see him fall once or twice, but I could see it. Hey, one of, see, one of the good things about being a big guy is I don't want to fall. Falling is not good. Um, so I I really, if, if I'm taking an inventory of yesterday, I did not fall yesterday. I did not fall yesterday. So that is a good sign. The reason why I do everything I can in my power not to fall is because when I fall, I get hurt. Um, for example, like one year, I'm like, I'm going to get super good at the park, right? Boxes, jumps. Late at, at North Star, they have the, it's called the tall box. So like, let's say I go stand next to the box. The, the box is probably about shoulder height, but you you have to jump onto, you have to go up a jump and land on the box. So it's tall. It's really tall off the ground. And you have to hop on and then you grind it out. I go up. I go up off the ramp. I'm like, oh, everything's fine. I land on the box, except I don't land flat. I land on my edge. My edge goes like this, whoosh, slides out, and I whiplash. Whip! I whiplash my face into the side of the box. The metal edge, the metal edge of the box, I whiplash my face into it and i put a hole through my face a hole there you, you could put your finger if you really wanted to through my face because i wh whap whap my face i thought i'd knocked all my teeth out to be honest with you i thought i knocked all my teeth out uh so <laughs> So I'm sitting there like embarrassed, like, damn, I really just whack my face against the box. And then I get up, I snowboard down to medical. Um, they had to super glue my face shut because uh, there's a hole there. Thankfully, I didn't lose any teeth, um, but they super glued it. And I was like, all right, well, now what? And they're like, do whatever you want. I'm like, All right. And I went back out and I finished snowboarding. Um, I've hurt myself so many times snowboarding. Um, uh, I have like a, I've got like a six inch scar here, right here on my shoulder because I was doing an angled box where you go up and down and it was the last run of the day and i'm like not giving a crap and i just came down the other side weird and i landed on my shoulder stage stage three shoulder separation tore all the ligaments everything in my shoulder um i have so many injury stories uh from snowboarding it's unbelievable um I've been snowboarding since I was middle school, middle school. Um, I would, I would definitely classify myself as an advanced snowboarder. Um, like for example, I had to traverse down the entire mountain, uh, Kirkwood at Kirkwood in order to get to my car. Um, so I had to go down the black diamonds, um, basically the face i did my best to avoid the cliffs so i avoided the cliffs i was not jumping off any cliffs nope but you want to give me back country you want to get me powder you want to get me going fast well i'm a big boy who goes fast they're like damn that that dude's moving I'm like yeah we 
you ain't first, you're last, baby. If you ain't first, you're last. Uh, so yeah, I I'm good enough where I I don't fall, which is also a learned skill because I've fallen so much that I've hurt myself that I can't fall, just can't do it. Uh, so I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Trying to get back into the flow of this 49er stuff. Um, feels like, how would you guys rank the mood amongst 49ers fans? How would you rank the vibes? I would say vibes amongst 49er fans, if we had to rate it one from 10, I would say we're chilling around a three. I don't know. I'm just not, I'm not catching the, the, this feels, it feels like the, the vibes of 49ers fans, um, kind of low. No. Am I reading it wrong? I, I just based on, and again, I also recognize the people that comment the shit that they comment are likely the most depressed of them all. But man, just looking, you guys know I, I deal, I, I have different segments of fans on every platform. So you, I got my YouTube squad. I got Facebook squad. I got Twitter squad. I got IG squad. There's not an overlap, not a lot of overlap between all those guys, between all those platforms. They're, they're pretty siloed with the people who engage on those platforms. Um, I would just say based on my read of it, uh, feels like everyone's kind of at a three or four. <laughs> Am I wrong? I don't know. I just kind of look around. I see a lot of people upset, um, obviously, with the outcome of the Super Bowl. I see people upset about the moves that are being made. Um, I just see a lot of people upset. Like, I think the 49ers posted something about, you know, the players doing some off field uh, stuff, you know, like helping out in the community, visiting sick kids. You go to the comments section, it's literally just people bitching about not winning the Super Bowl. It's just like, my God. It's like, really? Like, I get, I get people are upset. I get people are frustrated. I get it. I'm right there with you. But it's like, at what point are we just making it worse now? Like, I get it. It sucked. It sucked. I was there. I was there. I was. I watched the whole drive in person. Just happened in front of me, and just like thinking, like I know what's I know what's going to happen, but not being able to stop it from happening like i get it we all are hurt but it's like damn we gotta keep talking about it <laughs> like, can we just can we try to try to pretend like we're okay and just focus on the upcoming season please i get it though I get it, though. People are upset. I get it. I understand. Trust me. I understand. I understand. I do. I definitely do have ideas for, for a blocking tight end. For sure, for sure. For sure, for sure. I do. Stay tuned. I definitely do. It's it's high on my priority list, for sure. Um. So, yeah, man. Like, I think. I think for me, it's like I'd rather be around like-minded individuals who are extremely burdened by that loss, but also recognize that, hey, we have to move forward. Like, 
that loss was terrible. But we have to move forward. And I'd rather vibe with people who are, are in that boat. Like of, yeah, that sucked. That was brutal. That was the worst thing that I could have imagined of happening. But we got to move forward. Like we can't live in that moment. Or else, or, or what? Like, we just have to move forward. That's it. And then we'll get our hearts, we'll get our hearts broken again. And then we'll go through this together again. <laughs> oh, yes. You have to, you have to laugh so you don't cry, right? You got to laugh so you don't cry. <laughs> we'll get through this. We'll survive. And then we'll get our hearts broken again. Hey, it's fine. As long if we can wrap our heads around this reality, <laughs> maybe it won't hurt as much next time. But honestly, like, that's just, that's my vibe. Like, on, like, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to move forward. I'm not trying to sit in this, you know, I'm not trying to sit in like, I'm not trying to be like July 18th commenter Johnny 537 says, I don't care about this post because we didn't win the Super Bowl. Like, okay, I get it. I get it. You're, you're hurt. You're in pain. I get it. Let's move forward. Let's move forward. And we'll just get our hearts broken again. And we'll be right here for each other to go through it yet again. And just for the hopes of when we get that ring, oh boy, it will be so sweet. It'll be so sweet. But until then, hey, just got to keep moving. Got to keep pushing. Nothing we can do. Can't go backwards. Can't go back in time. Bitching about it ain't going to do nothing. So let's keep moving. And so um, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to keep moving. Bro, we're all, you guys know me. I'm a huge, I'm a huge 49er fan. Like, I don't ever try to front. Like, I'm not, um, I'm a huge 49er fan. So trust me, I feel this pain with you all. I'm not speaking to you as if I'm just someone who covers the 49ers. I am a fan. i appreciate this team and all the things that they do so i share that pain with you <laughs> trust me trust me i share that pain with you oh, good times good times anyways um thank you for being a part of my therapy session here um at the end uh hopefully maybe um, I don't know. I don't know. We just got to keep moving. That's the vibes. We got to keep building, got to keep moving. And, uh, one of these days we're not going to have to say what if anymore. So we're going to keep, keep on keeping on. Appreciate all you guys as always, uh, for staying tapped in, especially through the off season. Uh, <laughs> no pregnancy. Sorry, <laughs> Julie. Uh, make sure you join the discord chili drop drop the link if you got it um if you guys want to stay in tune with the chat chili best discord mod in the game uh it's not even up for debate um my guy keeps it moving in the discord you want to go vibe out there uh go drop in to the discord do all that good stuff but i uh, appreciate you guys as always grab a cookie on your way out and i'm out of here for now peace smash that like button if you haven't already love to see